Hey, what's up, makers? It's the Building 61 ground team for the latest high altitude balloon launch that we're doing here in Boulder, Colorado. Um, we're here uh, today to talk about our payload and what we're sending up on our next balloon launch. So we've got the team here behind me. They're uh, diligently working on various components uh, that are going to go as part of the payload, including the payload itself. You can see over here the, uh, the pink foam getting put together right now. So we've been doing this uh, the better half of this last afternoon. The last couple of days, we've had some pretty cool projects going on in the space. We learned the yeah. basics of Arduino. Uh, we worked on some Yagi antennas, talked about how we're gonna be able to track this thing while it's in flight. Uh, and uh, we covered our sensor data and how we're gonna be logging that. So probably now is as good a time as any to talk about maybe some of the components that uh, are going in this thing. How about Tupac and my group? Uh, yeah. Tupac, yeah. you want to talk with me? On yeah. This? Come on over here. All right. Right on. Yeah. yeah. I will. So I'm Jeff Branson. Um, I'm one of the team here at Building 61. Uh, this is one of our uh, space campesinos, yeah. Tupac. Uh, Tupac's going to help me talk about what we're going to send into space. And right. actually, Adam, can I uh, yes. can I use the overhead camera? Boom. So, okay. Oh, cool. There we go. So, Tupac, first off, what's this? Uh, this is the, um, um, what's the uh, Arduino? It's the Arduino, um, and it's where we're going to get the, um, the signal so that we can um, recover the balloon. Yep, and it records all the data. And yeah. so, do you remember what we did with this? Uh, yeah, this is the uh, you, the uh, where the data goes. Where the data goes so that we can recover. It. And these ones are the ones that are going to record it so that Sweet. we can have it. Uno más. Cool. And uh, do you remember what we're recording with this sensor? Uh, I think it was the um, the coordinates and the um, the weather. Yep, and temperature. Yeah, and temperature. Yep, super good. And then, uh, do you remember what we were calling this? Uh, I think um, I think that one we will, we were called uh, the location. Yep, GPS. Yeah, yeah, GPS. Awesome, awesome. Have you had fun? Yeah. Wait. And yeah. you did a bunch of coding on this, didn't uh, you? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So I'm going to let you go back to the build. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. All right. Cool. All right. Uh, There's some other stuff going up, I think, that is uh, going to make things really exciting for people if they tune in, hopefully, tomorrow. We're looking at a weather contingency right now. But uh, Adam, you want to talk about some of the ACE do that? Sure. So, oh, one of the things that we're most really excited about with this launch is we're going to be able to live stream this from the ground. So one of the cool things that we've got here is essentially a FPV camera <clears throat> and transmitter that has some telemetry data built right into it. And we're going to be able to use this to watch this from a ground station, and we're going to drop this right into the stream that we're going to be doing for the launch. So we're going to be covering conditions on the ground while we do the assembly, assuming this is all a go. Uh, we're going to have a roaming camera so we can see people working on the filling of the balloon. And this thing is going to give us footage uh, in the air. So what's happening with this is as this is receiving video, it's transmitting it wirelessly. We've got a ground station, which I'm going to grab. Play Benny Hill now. Please don't. So this is the ground station. And it this is this is a Yagi antenna. This is a little bit different than the one that we built during the camp. Uh, it is essentially a video-based transmitter. So this thing is directional. So you can think of this as like essentially trying to get data from a beam, uh, you know, wherever we're pointing it. So the operational range that they claim on this thing is about 14 kilometers. So that means that if we are pointing this right where we think the balloon is up in the air, in fact, we still might even be able to see it at that range, we should be able to get video in flight. Um, pretty exciting stuff. So once we get all that going, 
this is going to be pretty, uh, I don't know, we'll get some interesting telemetry on it. One of the nice things about the receiver is we get to see the pitch and the yaw. It's also going to tell us the altitude in the air. Of course, we're going to be getting that information as well from our APS transmitter, which we'll talk about in a little bit. I see Jeff behind me with some guiding stuff. And then yeah, so one of the things that we've covered in this camp are the radio communications protocols that get used in these kind of space flight um, and edge of space uh, applications. And radio tends to be one of those mysterious topics that don't get covered very well, particularly um, with primary education students. Uh, so we wanted to kind of un unravel that mystery for people. And we built these Yagi antennas. Um, we use tape measure elements. And this is a directional antenna. If you drive around on a day-to-day -day basis, what you'll see uh, on the lights above, uh, the cameras above traffic lights are these Yagi antennas. And they're actually beaming a radio signal to a specific location. And so we built a transmitter. And this is our transmitter. And it's actually transmitting right now. Um, Got this. I'm going to use Adam's trick of like getting right up on the. You can see the little radio transmitter module on here. And when I press that button, it transmits. And so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on my Yagi antenna. And so, the Yagi antenna is on, and there's a speaker on here, and it's looking for the radio signal that the transmitter is broadcasting. And when I press the button, We get the Imperial March. <laughs> but if I move away, you can hear it gets weaker. And it gets louder when we're actually pointing at the transmitter. I'll just walk away with it, for example. So we might. And it, it just it goes away. It's gone. But if I turn. So we spent a day building these out and uh, exploring kind of some of the ways that we're going to track this balloon and get the data back down to Earth while it's in flight. The same antenna transmitter receiver pair is working on the video equipment that Adam just showed. So there's kind of a theme that runs through all of this with the radio frequency. And it's um, we all love this. We kind of geek out on this project because we can go hide stuff and people can use the directional antennas to find it. So um, it turns into kind of a game for us. Yeah. Radio is a pretty essential part of this project because we need to be able to track this thing on the air and also find it while it's on the ground. So uh, we used this particular project to demonstrate how that worked. Uh, I'm going to dig out the APRS antenna that we just You do that. So if you're an educator um, and you're just tuning in on this or uh, somebody referred you to these resources on the web, all of this project is documented and it's open source and free and available to anybody to do. If you have questions about this, you want to run this in your setting, um, all of us are available to kind of help you walk through the resources that we've developed around this. Um, the Building 61 team has been exhaustive in how they've documented this project. So uh, we're super lucky to get to work with them in the education community. Thanks. Uh, APRS. APRS. That's what this is, this very spindly antenna. Uh, it's got a spot for a battery to load in this. This is a very uh, compact and professional grade uh, radio transmitter. Uh, I have a radio license to operate this type of thing. Um, you can get a ham radio license. It's totally free. Uh, you can take a test. There's lots of ham radio groups that exist around the country. Uh, it's a great way to get into a cool hobby uh, using uh, some some pretty uh, uh, interesting tech. Uh, this little transmitter, what it does is it is going to be uh, collecting signal or data in the air. So in this case, it's going to be doing altitude, temperature, and speed, uh, as well as GPS coordinates. And it transmits them uh, to various stations uh, that are owned by just users, ham radio users around the country. And that is essentially sent along to a website called APRS.fi. That's going to show us a map of what's going on locally. So you'll see lots of things happening on that map from the individual stations themselves. You're also going to see people who have APRS transmitters on their car. In our case, we're actually going to see a little icon of a balloon uh, in flight that we'll be able to track. So I'm going to try to pull that up on my computer. 
So you can see our last balloon flight. While they work in the background here. All right. Uh, okay, just give me a moment to throw this up on the screen. That's what you have to I, I totally trust that double stick, right? But they don't take over that that. You know, it's not that that camera is awesome. Okay. So, so it's StreamYard, you're probably seeing the map right now. This is from 2019. No, no, no. This is our uh, this is our launch that we did a test earlier this year. So uh, just a couple of months ago, we did a high altitude balloon launch. And here on the ADRS map, you can actually see the log of where the balloon had traveled. So we did our launch, of course, right outside the library. Periodically, it sends a signal. One of the neat things that happens here that we can see on the map is that each of these little nodes, it's telling us which radio station actually picked up that signal. We're going to be able to see some of those. Yes, you're seeing this overall range in terms of how far that radio signal was traveling. Uh, we're watching this the whole flight, so this is how we know where it is. Uh, at the very end of the flight, last transmission point can tell us that it was at an altitude of 6,017 feet. Uh, that is just a couple hundred feet off the ground. So at this point, it dropped behind a small hill. Uh, and we required our own handheld transmitter to actually go from this road and just try to trek around until it came up. And So we found it probably within 10 minutes after arrival, hoping that will go similarly on all future flights. All right, what else we got going on back here? Uh, the guys are hard at work here doing some like kind of fine assembly. And I was going to talk a little bit about what we've learned in terms of materials and processes for building our payload. Yeah. Um, while I'm doing that, do you want to grab like the one of the original payloads? Sure. Like the super, super cool payloads? OK. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Zach Weaver. I'm uh, also a creative technologist here at Building 61. Um, with the amazing Space Camp 22 crew. I want to talk a little bit about um, the other things that we're sending up in the flight line, including uh, everything from the balloon down to the payload. And I'm going to have these guys talk about the payload when they get a little bit closer here. They're in fine tuning mode. So obviously we start with the balloon. The balloon is um, a 600 gram balloon. It's from a company called Kmont, and they uh, supply, I think, like most of the high altitude um, civilian flights for um, like all of these kinds of experiments. So this balloon, it's awesome. It's it's going to be about seven feet wide when it is filled on the ground. And essentially, this is uh, because we kind of can't control our ascent and descent. That's those are levels of aviation that require licensing that these projects uh, do not require and that we do not possess. Um, essentially what this thing is gonna do is go up and up and up and up as the air pressure decreases, this balloon will expand and expand and expand and it will rupture at, at about a diameter of 20 to 30 feet, about 25 feet wide. If you wanna see a really cool video of that, um, check out uh, another video in our Space Camp playlist on this YouTube channel, it's really sweet. So that's the seven foot balloon that will fill that goes to the top. Um, underneath that is our, this is, a, this is as close as a controlled descent comes with us. It is, our, uh, it has a, a size rating or an area rating, Adam, you know that. This yes, is a, so there, we, we measure them out by uh, uh, essentially the foot diameter. This is a three foot diameter parachute. And this is actually probably slightly too small for what we're going to send up there weight-wise. Um, so we get a bigger one. Right. So Tomorrow there's, it's going to be a little heavier flight. There's a bit of a math uh, to that. So the bigger the parachute, it's more uh, uh, lift, essentially, that is occurring. It's going to mean a more uh, <laughs> a slower descent. Something like this, we might be hitting like 20 miles per hour. We want to be shooting between like 15, ideally. Uh, and what connects all of this stuff together? 
you may recognize this from your childhood or your adulthood. Um, this is kite string. And the reason that we use this particular kite string is that it has a shear strength that is in a safety range that is preferred for all of these things, which is uh, about 50 pounds. And that's quite a bit in terms of the things that we're connecting to it. Think the entire flight line will weigh maybe three or four pounds. But uh, if an aircraft of any kind runs into this type of string, um, it's just gonna shear. We hope that that won't happen. And to help avoid that, we do two things. One is we file um, a document with the Federal, a Federal Aviation Administration called a notice to air people. It's actually called a notice to airmen, but we don't like that. Um, and that gives our flight an official call sign that uh, the Federal Aviation Administration will track so that if any aircraft see us in the flight path, they understand um, that we are a civilian uh, high altitude balloon launch and that they're able to steer clear of us. The other thing that they need to know to steer clear of us is a really simple radar reflector. So um, amongst the many wonderful tools you should come check out at Building 61 are our laser cutters. And we found a really simple laser cut design. This on the inside of the foil is just some laser cut uh, cardboard. So it's very, very lightweight. I have 58 grams written on here as our weight. Uh, and then it is uh, just covered with literal uh, kind of a spray adhesive. And then on top of that, regular old kitchen uh, household aluminum foil. But this geometry at this size with this coating on the outside uh, makes us visible to modern aircraft radar. And uh, that's yet another safety feature that we have on all of these flights. Of course, most of this flight is going to be occurring twice to three times the cruising altitude of an airplane. Right. So we're yeah. well out of the way. So a lot of people ask, well, you're really close to uh, where do you launch from and how do you avoid uh, aircraft? So you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So uh, just in terms of the launch, uh, we control the burst altitude. Uh, and that is a combination of knowing the weight of the payload. So everything that the balloon is lifting, uh, the balloon weight itself, this is a 600 gram balloon, which it gets to like seven feet wide up in the air. There's bigger balloons. Um, so with that combination, we're going to know how quickly this thing is going to ascend and at what altitude it's going to burst. So as long as we've done our math right, we're probably close, you know, within like five or 10 percent uh, to that uh, prediction. The other nice thing about this is that there's some pretty cool predictors out there. Uh, one of them uh, is used to uh, uh, just show us information about wind patterns. So. We can actually enter all of the information that we know from the payload uh, weight, uh, the ascent so rate, how quickly it's going to descend, uh, and what the burst yeah, altitude yes. is going to be. And we'll find out pretty quickly uh, whether or not our landing is going to be somewhere where yeah. we want it to go. Yeah, and that's absolutely. one of the things that we're looking at for tomorrow yeah. is just knowing where it's going to land to right now. We're in kind of some weird monsoon weather going on right now, and that is meaning that. All the balloons are tending to go north and then come back south again, yeah. just based on the prevailing winds. And we don't want to land, say, like in the middle of Denver. That's going to be pretty tricky to recover. Ideally, we want to land in some farmland or open space. That's where we're shooting for. Let's be What if we got crew? Uh, well, you know, I'm a tape fiend. And that any makerspace should allot 30 full percent of its annual budget to tape purchases. Sure. So uh, these guys are just asking, like, how do we secure uh, something like a GoPro camera? Which, uh, honestly, one of our favorite things to, to retrieve because we get awesome flight footage. Uh, we, a lot of times, are just using several adhesives. And we're going to do a little strength demo between. So, Tubot, can you demonstrate one more time? This this is standard masking tape. So just pull that apart. Still pretty tough, but I think you can do it. Just grab it and just like. There it is. Yeah, it's just right around. There it goes. It pops. Okay. Now this. Try it with that. This is called monofilament tape. 
It's okay. Don't. It's going nowhere. It's going nowhere. <laughs> so monofilament tape is essentially like one strand of, of fiberglass that runs throughout that roll of tape. And so to strap everything together at the end and to strap in important pieces of electronics like camera, we'll just kind of run that all the way around the outside and make sure that that camera footage doesn't include an, an, an uncradled descent <laughs> down to uh, her. The helpful thing to try to avoid. Yeah, we can look at one of the old tailors here. You can see. This is the kind of thing get out of the way. that effectively, this is the kind of thing that effectively we'll be sending up tomorrow, though this team has come up with a, an all new design. Get a look at that, Rich. No. Um, so good way to segue back to this. When we began balloon flights, it was the year of the 50th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing, Apollo 13, or no, not 13, I'm sorry, 11. 13 did not go that well. Um, and so we designed this payload that's vacuum formed to uh, you know, kind of honor that shape and that tradition and evoke the qualities of that really austere space capsule look. And this is a very, very thin plastic. And this is a very, very thin, uh, it's, it's our heat shield, right? What? This, <laughs> this is our... This is our heat shield. It's made out of a, a much, a much tougher uh, plastic, and it's not as attractive, I think, as a head. This is all no. right. <laughs> uh, we realized a couple of things were happening, and it was mainly because, honestly, we tend to learn as we go here, and it was no different with this project. Um, one of the things that we learned was that the camera was, for some reason, cutting out in every flight. We'd find the payload and we would see that the, that the batteries had shut off, the camera had shut off, and we, we weren't exactly sure what. Part of the reason is that batteries in really cold temperatures, um, and it's quite cold anywhere. If you've ever been on top of uh, Colorado Mountain, you know that it's always a bit cooler up there. Well, we're going into 60, 70, 80, 90, 100,000 feet, so it's very cold up there. And we realized that we were having a, a voltage drop, which is related to the temperature. And that's something that happens to batteries. And so we have to have specific types of batteries, but not only that, but that's how we choose to use some insulation material. So what essentially what we're doing with this payload design is we're building a warming hut for, oh, I'm getting some crazy sunlight there. Magic hour. We're building a little, <laughs> yeah. Ooh, influencers. Ooh, influencers. Uh, we're building a little warming hut for the batteries um, and then routing cables to go to the outside where the, where the camera mounts are. Um, this is pink foam insulation that you can buy at pretty much any hardware store. And what's happening here in the background is it's just being uh, initially assembled with some really nice high quality two sided tape. And then once everything is roughly assembled, we'll reinforce all of the corners with some aluminum insulation tape to make sure that we're trapping the heat in the areas we want heat. And in some cases that I'll let these guys explain, also allowing the air outside to cool off some components that would otherwise be mm, too hot. Um, not Duncan or Gabe. Can I ask you guys a couple of questions over here? Sure. So, Gabe, state your name for the record. Uh, Kim's right there. I'm Gabe Gehoitum. Yeah. And uh, so, tell us about the the flight tracker that that you built. You guys designed and built one of those yesterday, right? Yeah. And what are the components in that? Let's recap. Tupac already went over this, but what are the components in those flight trackers? Well, we had the uh, Arduino board, uh, which is like, I guess, the motherboard, what you code on to. And then we had like the breadboard. Uh, and then, of course, like the tracker itself. And then uh, we had a, um, what's that thing called? The chip thing? I forget what it's called. Oh, uh, it measures something. What does it measure? No, I mean like the chip oh, that the you plug into the computer as well. Oh, the uh, recorder. Yeah. yeah, so the data logger. Yeah, we had right. That and then we also had the um, another chip that measured um, 
temperature and uh and so yeah and one other thing what is the the temperature temperature and pressure pressure and then one other thing the uh height yes the altitude altitude right? height yes and then there's one other component on your flight tracker which is the actual like tracker right yeah it's a gps receiver it's right GPS. yeah which uh you point up and then it uh finds different uh different satellites uh that are all scanning down in little dots and then it finds a uh, like a it's in a point where all the satellites like a little like crossover where it's getting the data from all the satellites and that tells it like its exact coordinates of where it is tells us our coordinates of where we're at and we even yeah. tested that check the coordinates that we were getting right outside and lo and behold it was uh, right where we were yeah, yeah we checked we, it on google right? we are in fact where we are which yeah. is an existential relief to be honest um so part of the design that's happening behind us we've had to move two of those components into a specific position why are we doing it uh you mentioned one the gps yeah the gps needs to be has to be up. pointed up so it can actually receive the satellite uh the satellite info and then what about the other sensor the other sensor it, or it has to be outside the box yeah uh because you know if it's because then it's getting the actual uh data from the outside air like temperature because it was in the box it would be definitely not as hot or cold as it would be outside because you know all the batteries are making heat and and of course it's not getting as much like wind and other stuff that would uh yeah right yeah so we're we're just getting it out there to measure it so the design of the payload that you've been doing this afternoon has incorporated all of these details to allow us to not only get the sensors outside but we have to assemble this thing just before we launch right yeah and so you're designing clever little ways right now for us to move these sensors to the outside before we kind of seal everything up and actually send it up right yeah cool thanks gabe yeah, uh, anything else you want to say about the week any favorite uh events or things that you remember besides the delicious snacks uh you know the um for basically the tracking like what we did with the antenna mm -hmm. uh we did that on the second day so two days ago and that was definitely my favorite thing that I built that was really cool it's pretty cool isn't it yeah it was fun to play like hide and sweep with it yeah and would you say that you how much how much have you learned about uh, electronics and coding and construction is it is a lot of new stuff for you are you pretty familiar with these things uh the electronic part was pretty new to me I've done basic stuff definitely nothing like that uh the coding I've done coding in the past so I kind of knew what was going on but i've never coded like stuff to electronical parts so and it, thumbs up thumbs down you dig it double thumbs up nice yeah <laughs> awesome. all right thanks. cool yeah. thanks good yeah all right how's progress back home good good yeah exactly. well i think if you guys are ready here pretty soon i want to do a couple of things one we want to have them print their official Space Camp t-shirts, which is happening just behind Tupac there. And two, I think it'd be cool if you guys can get uh, at whatever state it's in, get your payload underneath the camera here and uh, show people the design that you've come up with this afternoon. Um, if you're in the middle of something, go ahead and finish that. I'm going to put on the Benny Hill music and just take five, let people chill and see what's happening here. No, Adam says no on the Benny Hill music. Um, all right, I, I'm going to look at the comments for suggestions. No, yep, pretty quiet crew today. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> then uh, I'm not not talking to anybody if I'm not talking. That's great. Good. Yeah, do this. Uh, we're going on that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you guys want to? You guys ready to do it? Yeah. Yeah, bring it over. Let's make some space. And. I don't know. I'm crazy. 
Oh, that's on two, Adam. Tip two. Uh, the red button, the big red button. Yep, tip two. This two. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. So, uh, here's the basic structure of our payload. We're, it's a box made out of foam. <laughs> uh, it's, so far, that's what we've got. We've, uh, but it's made to store uh, stuff that's a little bit uh, more important. We got a go camera. We got a camera. Where is the thing? Or which is going to go right in here. It's going to go right in here. I'm having. There, if you can see that, that's how it's going to be in there. We've also got the battery. Uh, this, this is probably the most important thing. Uh, it's, uh, it's our Arduino. We've got the GPS and we've got a temperature sensor, also senses pressure. Um, and our goal here is to keep it protected and keep it buoyant. Here, maybe load the whole thing up so the miners are good. Just like leave it in there piece by piece so people can see what's flying. So here's yeah, our another camera. Yeah, there's another camera on this. It's also got a nice antenna. Why don't we put that in there? There's a battery for that. There's a battery for that. I'm not going to connect that up quite yet. There's a, here's another battery. That's to power our Arduino. Uh, both of these, uh, both of these components are going to be popped out through the top of our casing. There's going to be a lid on here. We haven't quite done that yet, but this will be plugged into here so we can have a little bit of power. And here's our backup GPS. So this will be going in here. <laughs> and this is just about what we're sending. Yeah. Uh, we've got a little bit more foam to cut up, but here's here's the electronics. Here's the base of stuff. Yeah, that's it. All right, nice job, fellas. Uh, I think that's bigger than my apartment, actually. So well done. All right, let's uh, let's get back to tidying up that stuff. Just a few more spots. I think. Are you? Uh, do you want to? Debut, or should we have one of these guys debut the uh, <laughs> the new Space Camp logo and T-shirt? <laughs> Literally hot off yeah, the press. Hot off the press over here. So here it is. <laughs> awesome. Building 61 Space Camp, and this is our flight that we're going to have on the APRS Building 61-Tab 22A. That is how we're going to be designating our balloon flights going forward. Red. I think that's uh, pretty close to wrapped up at this point. I don't know if we have anything left to show. I don't think we do. I think it's mostly like putting uh, the finishing touches on the payload. And I think these guys have done an awesome job at figuring out exactly what they had to do. Robbie, on a scale of uh, you know 10 to 10, <laughs> how, how have these guys done this afternoon? And actually, maybe talk for a little bit about the process and ask these guys, like, what were some of the considerations like uh, or the process in an abstract way? Like, how do we make decisions about how do we do this stuff? Well, for starters, I would definitely say they were at least a 10. <laughs> definitely hope to work with these guys again. <laughs> um, yeah, we just kind of started the design with just talking about what components needed to be protected from temperature changes and what components need to be separated from 
batteries heated up and heating up, but obviously the campers need to not be flocked. Yeah. Um, so we just kind of laid things out and they decided where they wanted things to go and came up with some pretty good strategies. Yeah, it's a pretty and Spartan and house. Have any, any comments about that experience? This is an awesome and fun engineering experience. Yeah, <laughs> very cool. Uh, and what are what are our chances of, uh, what do you guys give us for chances of survival given this design? Have you built a strong foundation for this aerial home? Let's talk so. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, let's hope so. I think so. I feel like, you know, they, they caught some of the things that they caught that I that were critical to the design is, you know, when this thing lands, it's coming in at about 17 miles an hour. It It is going to absorb some force. So we want that to protect the electronics. Uh, we also want it to uh, just kind of like level out that impact. And they figured that out. It, it can't really be like a cylindrical tall design. It needs to be more of a broad design. We'll suspend it uh, onto the flight line in a way where it's, it's flat and level as we can get it. Um, so they, they came up with a lot of really good uh, details and they've done an awesome job of putting things together. So uh any any final thoughts space camp crew no no we're good sure. we just like wrap this up today and pray for good weather tomorrow great job team yeah, nice. yeah. all right yes the in response to the question uh in the chat yes the launch will be live uh whether or not it happens tomorrow we are hoping for good weather and good winds we will find out uh you will, we'll notify you uh, via social media uh, or otherwise as soon as we know one way or the other. And how's the prediction looking right now? Ed? We have a pretty narrow landing zone. So <laughs> if it works out, we're in good shape. But yeah. if the weather changes too much, uh, we're going to have to reschedule to one other time. But uh, that will be soon. Yeah. And if that happens, um, you can check out. We're going to post on our website. Uh, at building61.org. We're going to post on social media. We're mainly on Instagram, and we'll probably put it out on Twitter. We're just at BLDG61. Uh, and uh, we'll update the, the calendar also at, at uh, building61.org on the calendar links. So we will do everything we can to let folks know um, that we've had to scrub the flight. We've never had to do that before, but uh, it's a weird weather summer. It's the first time for everything. Yeah. And we'll so find out what happens. we'll see how it goes. But fingers crossed. Um, wish us well. And uh, if everything happens, we're going to take off around 11 a.m. tomorrow morning. So brilliant. OK, thanks for tuning in, everyone. Uh, keep on making. Uh, we'll see you at the launch. Bye. <laughs>